Hi everyone, good evening. My name is James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And I have to confess to being unnaturally excited about the conversation we're about to have tonight. Um, one of the jokes about the newsrooms I've worked in is that I have a particular fondness for news stories that either have no good pictures, i.e. that you can't tell with some dramatic piece of footage, or particularly if you work in a daily paper, will take you somewhere between two, five and ten years to figure out those stories of long term developments. But we set up Tortoise with this idea that you wouldn't try and understand or add to breaking news, you would try to get a better read on what's driving the news. And my co-founder, Katie Vanek-Smith, came up with this idea towards the end of last year, which was, imagine if you could put together coalitions of people and in the run up to COP, do a series of thinkings that tried really to take what is, if you like, the line drawings that you get from a lot of other newsrooms or from a lot of the politics and do some meaningful colouring in, really begin to understand how a new sustainable economy might work. And so today, what we're trying to do is think about the changes in skills, the changes in employment, the changes in workplaces that will be required for us to move to a sustainable economic future. We're going to, in the course of the coming months between now and COP, look at what capital allocation means, what happens when $5 trillion flows into renewable energy over the course of the next decade, what would that look like? We're trying to understand the arguments around the metrics here, what does net zero really mean? We're going to talk about that next month. But today I'm really grateful to Rebecca and Sam because if you really want to understand changes in what's required in terms of employment and labour markets in the way we work, you're, you're, you're hard pressed to do better than Rebecca Diskey and Sam Alvis. Rebecca has you know, pretty freshly completed a set of work precisely on this subject. Sam has spent a good time working on the subject. And I suspect if you're on this thinking, you, you've got a point of view. If you're new to thinking, you'll know, you, sorry, you won't know that our principle here is no questions. What we want is everyone to bring their point of view. So please weigh in in the chat, my colleague Barney McIntyre, is here marshalling uh, the chat. I'm gonna to come to Barney, actually, I'm gonna to come to you in a bit, Barney, if you can, just to talk over some of those slides that you've chosen, because we jump around from the WEF, from the World Economic Forum, to the ILO, to the International Labour Organization. And we've picked and chosen some of those pieces of data, and I want to talk to you about them. But I'm gonna start, if I might, with you, Rebecca. Um, as I said, you, you, you've thought about this both in a sectoral way, but in a regional way too. And I wondered whether you could, if you like, just give us a start by answering the question, what, what, what do you think a green collar jobs going to require and, and what do we need to do, all of us, in order to be fit to, to take them up? Um, so, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really big question. And um, the report that I've just produced with some colleagues at the New Economics Foundation where I work, looks at this question specifically in Yorkshire and the Humber, but obviously a lot of the arguments are applicable um, to other parts of the country, particularly kind of um, high areas that rely on high carbon industry. But one of the main arguments I, do, I make is that we don't know exactly um, what, a, what a kind of just transition will, uh, will look like, what a transition that's fair to workers will look like, because it, it won't be fair unless it's um, designed, co-designed by those workers um, and, and their unions. So I just want to make that that kind of point at, at the start that, you know, there isn't a very clear roadmap. Um, and and the, if we want to develop a roadmap that is going to be fair, it needs to have um, the people that are involved, you know, that are going to be affected by these changes. Um, they need to have some agency in the process. Um, but there are some really clear um, things that can be done for, in the framework um, to, to make, um, green jobs a reality on the scale that we need. Um, the first is investment. Um, so, you know, government, um, our government has, has made a lot of pledges and has, has um, I'd say, talked a good talk. Um, but as one of the slides at the beginning popped up um, showed, I think that the TUC recently did some research a couple of weeks ago in advance of the G7 that showed that compared to the rest of the G7 bar Japan, um, we're actually really 
quite far behind. So um, the Treasury is spending £180 per person um, in the UK on green jobs compared to almost £3,000 per person in the US and um, almost £600 per person in Germany, for example. So there's a lot more that can be done in terms of investment. And obviously that investment leads to um, confidence you know, in, in um, business wanting to create the jobs here as well, wanting to be based here, uh, if they think they've got um, some support from the government. Um, so, so investment to create jobs and to attract business, um, then skills, you know, we, we need to skill people up to go into those jobs. Um, that's both reskilling um, and upskilling people who might be in high carbon jobs right now, but could have, you know, actually really applicable skills um, for, for greener jobs. Um, but also looking at people coming into the labour market um, and particularly young people and equipping them with the skills for um, the various industries that some of which don't really exist here or are very underdeveloped in the UK. Uh, so we, you know, to kind of cap that off, uh, also sort of, you know, provide the framework, we need a really, you know, we really need a clear industrial strategy from, from the government. And that's that, that means both for transitioning sectors. So that's sectors that will have to decarbonize. Um, either they'll have to decarbonize or they'll have to be phased out. Um, and it's for new sectors in, you know, like the growing sectors like renewable energy and um, retrofitting, for example. Um, we, need, we need something that overarches it all and we need devolved powers um, at regional level for the, for the local authorities and the um, leaders in those areas that really know what their regions need and which jobs are going to be lost um, to be replaced. Um, so that's, you know, we need lots of things at different levels. Um, Rebecca, can I, can I ask you this? Because I suppose what I'm trying to do, and I think what we're trying to do in thinkings like this, is kind of come away with a kind of considered point of view. And forgive me, I'm a journalist, I come at some of this with a bit of scepticism. So I, I'm going to just start by asking Barney. Barney, would you be able to bring the, the slide, that, that International Labour Organization slide up? And just, because, because in Rebecca's, um, I hope you'll put the link in Rebecca's research uh, into Humber, because the, the thing that struck me, Rebecca, was you're saying, 15% of people in that region are exposed, 360,000 people who've got jobs in, I think what you're calling them sort of high carbon industries. Is that a fair, fair description? The, the ILO, the, the, this slide, just talk us through it, Barney, and then I'm gonna come back to you, Rebecca, because I want to know whether or not you buy the basic implication of this, which is that the green revolution is going to be a jobs creator rather than a jobs destroyer. Do, do, Bonnie, do you want to just sort of say where you got this data and what you think it says? Yeah, sure. I mean, so it's from the International Labour Organization. It should be said that it's from 2018. So actually, it could be quite likely that the picture has completely changed in terms of what sort of jobs are going to be required um, post pandemic. You know, we've got a lot more research into what a kind of green recovery would look like now. So this could be a, a different picture. But by a simple calculation, they've sort of said, OK, 18 million jobs are going to be created in the energy sector. That means uh, transitioning. But it's also, I assume, partly to do with, um, you know, making sure that uh, old industries that, you know, like, like fossil fuels, like those um, high carbon industries find a way out and, you know, uh, you know, are able to move into renewables and other parts of uh, that, that energy sector. But then also there's this uh, 6 million jobs which will come from the circular economy. So that is anything from manufacture to recycling to making sure that things are reusable. Um, it should be said that, you know, the definition of a green job is quite a kind of loose enforced thing. I mean, in terms of uh, different statistics, put it different ways. You know, the ONS has a specific um, definition. And uh, there's actually something we were talking with, with Sam about is that there are different types of uh, definitions of green jobs. So, you know, Give or take, this, this, these, these figures could be uh, interpreted in all, all sorts of different ways. These figures are worldwide, um, according to the International Labour Organization. Um, and then obviously the third part of this we're thinking about is which jobs are going to be lost. Um, and that is obviously in carbon intensive industries like typical ones that we would think of, oil and gas, that sort of thing. But also things that, you know, like manufacture, you know, steel, are there other, other areas that we need to be thinking more about? So, so, so Bonnie, thank you. Rebecca, will you just comment on this? Because here's my scepticism, is that whenever a new new thing comes along, we'll try to, both politicians and financial backers of it, and perhaps even organisations like the ILO, want to be positive on the future and then give you this version of events that says overall it's going to be a job creator. Do, do you buy that view? Um, 
in a in a word I, I do or yes um <laughs> but I, do, I it isn't that simple like it, it abs- absolutely will not happen um overnight or by itself or without really really serious well thought out um concerted government action um so first I want to um just expand a bit on Barney's point on like what is a green job um there are various definitions and in, at, at NEF, we do have a, a much broader definition than you know most people are used to. Um, we go f- much further than just um, renewable energy and um, circular economy and things like that. But actually, we think more about what are the kinds of jobs that we will need in a low carbon future. And so, of course, all of those are really necessary, um, crucial. But we will also need lots more healthcare workers, um, lots more care workers, lots more teachers, um, lots more people working in pub- public transport. Um, and you know all of those jobs are actually inherently low carbon but they're not really seen as green jobs and and there's a, there's if we do consider them as green jobs or at least low carbon jobs and talk about them um, as part of the same conversation although not necessarily part of the same industrial strategy um, that does you know really beef up the numbers um, but it is you know it does bring obviously um, a complicated um, angle into it. The, 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 the reason I ask Rebecca is if you look at the pattern of the digital revolution it has obviously caused um, you know, created unprecedented wealth but concentrated in very few hands and geographically speaking concentrated in very specific places so if you're one of those 360,000 people what do you think your prospects are that that region of the UK is going to see the loss of those carbon intensive jobs replaced by you know green collar jobs yeah. So firstly, I should I should clarify that the 360,000, um, those are people currently working in sectors with high or very high emissions. That doesn't mean that they're that, that those jobs won't exist. Um, so, for example, that includes steel. Um, I argue that um, we should absolutely be keeping steel, you know, the, the British steel industry alive. Um, we should be, t- you know, making it green steel. So um, one of the recommendations is the government bring the bring forward the clean um, steel fund. So we should be investing in the um, in the technology that is there, you know, that the, the Swedish government has done very effectively, for example, um, to keep to lower emissions, to keep those jobs here and to protect them. Um, and, and in the same um, stroke, not offshore both those jobs and, and the emissions elsewhere, which is what's likely to happen otherwise. Um, so they're not all at risk. Um, and then within that, there are lots of um, jobs uh, that just, yeah, so, you know, industries that just need help to decarbonize. Um, I think the Grantham Institute um, did some similar research that showed 260,000, so a, sm- a smaller number in the same region, had skills that are going to need, um, you know, changing, that are going to be in much less demand. Um, and with that, when you're talking about that number, those 260,000, at the moment, to be honest, they can't have a lot of confidence that they're going to get the green jobs um, in, in the coming revolution, whether it's a revolution or not, um, because they their past experience is not that, you know, <laughs> like um, especially in you know these deindustrialized areas, they hurt, they're still suffering from the scars of um, the the mine closures, the factory closures um, of the 80s and onwards. Um, the last, in fact, 2015, and those were generally handled not very well. And that what's left in the in their wake is um, usually low paid, precarious uh, jobs in the service sector or on warehouses, but things like that. So at the moment. Um, that you know, I, I think that there is absolutely potential, but government um, needs to do a lot more work to build trust that it can happen. Um, but I do think that physically it, it can and it should. I, I'm gonna, Rebecca, I'm going to come come to you because I want to just I want to bring in Sam, who's waited rather patiently as we got got stuck into this. Um, Sam, you you know I, I know that you are the head of green renewal at the Green Lights. Is that right? Actually, I know yep. I know that. You often say these things, it turns out someone's just changed jobs or there's got a complete, there's another Sam Alvis. But the one that we think we're talking to is that person. But Sam, the, the reason I was looking up at the, the sort of things that you've done and working in, you know, working for the Wellcome Trust, working for Tony Blair, working for Shadow Treasury team. Just pick up on where Rebecca left off, if you would, which is, and forgive me for putting this question, if you like, with a slight curve on it. We often, when we see these big changes, want government to help us through it. Where do you think the balance lies between government, state investment, state regulation, providing the preconditions for these jobs, and actually for private sector investment, for the market to make that happen? 
Yeah, so I think it depends which kind of green job you're talking about. So the problem with this sweeping green jobs or even the government's current narrow conception of it is somewhere you can put a hard hat on and, and stand outside some, a big shiny piece of infrastructure yeah. is that we're missing, as Rebecca says, what the actual net zero economy is going to look like. So the way I'm thinking about that at the moment is that, yes, you have a portion of specific somewhere jobs. Those are those are your infrastructure, your carbon capture and storage, they are going somewhere very specific and probably tied to an existing skill base. Then you've got a sort of general level community everywhere jobs. These are things like repair and recycling, um, home energy efficiency, charging installation, or like green restoration. They're going to every single area. You've got jobs where industry is going to change around your existing jobs. So if I spray paint petrol cars, there is no reason I can't spray paint electric cars, providing my business gets ahead of the, the electric vehicle revolution. And similarly, producing green steel, I think, is a great example. If we, if we sort that out, somebody who manufactures steel, steel, their job's going to change very little. And then finally, there's a whole portion of jobs where green skills are going to just be a tag onto their existing career. So if you're talking about a doctor who works in an A&E and is trying to reduce the waste, or somebody who's a sustainable finance leader at a major bank, like it's, it's a very similar skill set, but your topic difference. And I think that means you've got to have a different policy solution for each one of those. So the problem we know with net zero is that it's a high upfront cost, but lower resource cost in the in the long run. So for some things, for the big shiny infrastructure, yes, you do need government investment upfront. Similarly, for home energy efficiency, we need government investment upfront to crowd in the private capital to get things moving. But for some, for some of the others, there are tweaks we can do. So. If the UK infrastructure bank, which is a fantastic new tool, has, for example, a better definition of infrastructure that includes a natural environment, that includes circular economy, then they can invest, they can guarantee in the projects that are going to deliver a whole different range of jobs, whether that is a repair shop in a local town or um, better peatland, uh, which we know crowds in loads and loads of jobs. There's also Does a it? series- Does it? Yeah, huge amount of jobs. So we've just had some research out that actually um, trees, peatland and uh, seagrass planting can deliver 12,000 jobs in some of the constituencies that have been hardest hit from furlough, from uh, labour market risk during the pandemic. Um, you'd be surprised by how many jobs. It's not just what, what planting job? trees. So you've got people doing project management. You've got people doing customer retail. You've got people doing uh, site mapping with drones. You've got people doing research and development. There's a huge amount of very varied roles in these areas uh, that we're not even looking at at the moment. Um, and then finally, I think you've got a, a suite of tools that Treasury, for example, already has to encourage business investment, to encourage businesses to do things that it would like to see. So you take the super deduction, this massive 120% tax relief that they announced in the last budget. That doesn't have any green strings attached whatsoever. So if I'm sitting in a business, theoretically, I could use that to go towards my uh, my new coal furnace. It's a terrible idea. It's not going to last. It's not going to deliver jobs in the long run. So if you start putting the regulatory framework out there, tweaking the way we make policy, that actually makes it a lot easier for private investment to go, oh, I see this is the direction of travel. Oh, I've read the heat and buildings decarbonisation plan that's coming out. I know government have got a yearly zero electric vehicle mandate. The regulation... The, um, the policy making, if we direct it towards green, you're much more likely to get that private investment. Uh, I, so if you took the principle of super deduction or you even made a super, super deduction in which you said, look, we're going li to link these investment incentives or tax reliefs to certain outcomes, that would have, that's what you mean. But can I, but, but sorry, can I put both to you? And please, everyone do feel free to weigh in. Um, uh, and apologies if I'm being contrary about this, Sam, but... <laughs> I've got, a, I've got an issue with both, I suppose, the direction that you and Rebecca take this in, which is the completely understandable wish that this ends up being fair, right? But I've only lived through one great industrial revolution, which has been tech, right? And all I've seen is concentration of capital in the hands of a few and huge wage polarization. And it seems to me as though it's much more likely that what you're going to see with the green revolution is a version of the same huge returns to those people who own the intellectual property that develops next generation systems of energy generation and huge uh, wage polarization between those people who are doing if you like some of the local delivery jobs around energy versus those people who've who own the systems of production and distribution yeah and and to be honest, James, the public are with you. So we've just finished a series of focus groups and time and time again, the public will say, 
we like green, we really care about green stuff, but we're not going to do it unless it is a good quality job. And that's a real shift actually that you've seen between the first lockdown and now is that actually there's this real drive towards familiarity and a return to normal rather than a change and improvement of doing something different. There is no reason, as Rebecca says, that you have to allow that to happen. We haven't, this industrial revolution, the green one, is going at a pace far, far faster than everyone we've had previously, and it involves many more boots on the ground. So government has a number of levers that it can pull, whether that's in procurement, whether that's in UK Invest Infrastructure Bank, whether that's partnering with local authorities, the sort of stuff it hasn't actually done before to say, we are mandating that you pay a good wage for this. We are mandating there is good hours attached. There right. is no there is no reason that it is out of government's control. It's only going to happen if you decide it not to. Right. So you could so so that's what you're so it's quite an interesting model that you're describing, if I understand that right, which is the government or the UK Infrastructure Bank or through tax regulation says, we are going to kickstart, we are going to pump prime these green, this green revolution, but we're going to have a set of conditions around labour, around employment and jobs that goes alongside it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Re Re Rebecca, t t take us, if you would, back to the, the reason I want to sort of hone in on your most recent research is I think we often get quite airy in these conversations and we you know we talk about big picture things and the government must help and you know all the revolution but but you know you talk to people at British Steel for example and what's your outlook if you're a let's say you're a British Steel worker in your 40s what's your what's the how do you get from here to there how do you get out of a high intensity carbon job to your next one um yeah I mean I think that that's a a really good question at the moment um most I'd, I'd say that most british steel workers um don't feel like there is an obvious route um and don't have confidence in the kind of you know part of the issue is that you know what are green jobs you know no, no one it's a very abstract term and they they they're used to mean all sorts of things and no one really knows um you know on the ground working working in a um, an ungreen job, um what kind of thing that would mean for them in their lives and and that's why you know they're understandably sceptical. Um, so the steel industry is actually quite an interesting example because um, I would maybe say it's the closest we've ever had to a past just transition. So in, in 67, I think it was, um, the British government um, took a majority stake in British steel um, as um, several plants closed and thousands of job, jobs were lost, but they, um, they staggered it um, over several years um, to cushion the impact and they had quite a serious uh, retraining program and compensation for people who couldn't retrain or were close to retirement for example and that's the sort of thing that happens um, much more on the continent and um, like with the German coal industry for example in Canada actually is um, similarly done something like that with coal um, so you you would need to you know to for, for a 40, 40 year old British steel worker to have confidence um, that they were not going to be left worse off by the transition you would need um, a plan from government and from your employer and that would have had to have been worked out with your union british steel is very very highly unionized as are a lot of these carbon intensive um, industries um, of what exactly it's going to look like um, for you what training are you going to get what compensation you get um, in, for, for steel i'd hope that people would actually just like be retrained slightly um, and in many um, cases as, as sam pointed out it probably wouldn't actually change your job very much um, but for industries that are actually going to transition out, um, they will need to be provided with with a plan, and that that means um, a, a so, you know social dialogue, um, which is a conversation between unions um, or workers and their employer and the government, um, and guarantees that they're not going to be left worse off before, than before. Rebecca, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask if I can to bring in Judith Smith, just because Judith makes two points, both about. The skills that we need but also who's going to provide them i don't know judith can you hear us and can we see you yes there you are hello judith on my, on my. hi hello there hi um i've obviously got a i have a bee in my bonnet about this so um okay, i'm quite it... interested in it um i I'm fairly recently retired, but um, did work for, well, 20 years in Yorkshire and Humber, particularly around um, skills development, transition of people with vocational skills through 
education, further education colleges into possibly higher education. And um, I'm quite interested to hear what is happening around skills development um, in terms of the level of skill, what, what do we mean by skill and what do we mean by the level of skill that will be required in these new jobs? Just an example, um, I was watching local TV and um, they were talking to people who were working for Siemens on the new wind machines, which obviously probably features in your um, report, Rebecca. And um, the people they were talking to were recent graduates. Now, if you're a person who lives in the middle of Hull, West Hull, and you've had very low level standard of education, what job are you going to get out of the Green Revolution? And that is what really concerns me, because is, if it's a technician level, that isn't a graduate job. Mm. That is a level which is at level four or five, just beyond A level. But also some of the way that we measure the skills um, that are required for these jobs are actually to try and m mimic, if you like, an A level. And actually, these are vocational jobs, the technical jobs, the not academic jobs, and yet we measure them in an academic way. So I do have a big concern so, so, about that. So, sorry, sorry. I think like lots and lots of people, I don't know whether you can see they're nodding, but I'm not sure exactly whether or not the nod is, yes, you're right, they are technical jobs, or whether the nod is, and in which case we need to put more money into FE colleges, into further education, and, and recognise in the way in which Germany does the value of the, that technical education and technical jobs. Lost. Or whether you think, oh, can you hear me? It's just suddenly, I've, I've messed up somehow. You, have you lost? Up. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, <laughs> I just have a, anyway, go on, sorry. Could you, not, could you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. Can you not hear me now? I can, I can. But Judith, yeah. my question was, my question back to you is, are you saying, yes, these are technical jobs, but the truth is there's a kind of ceiling on what their earning potential is, so there's a problem with that, or are you saying we don't have an education system that enables people to train for those technical jobs? Yeah, I, I query um, what level the jobs are. I don't really know. Um, we hear so much about these green jobs, but what exactly are they and what's the requirement? For example, if somebody comes along and measures my boiler, um, services my gas boiler at the moment, um, I notice that they use a computer. They, they have very little uh, knowledge and understanding of the nature of how the boiler works and so on. They're, they're really working to script in order to do it. Now, that isn't massive level of skill required. That is a specific skill for that job. And I think, I think you know, that's what I'm trying to guess. If, we, if we're moving with green jobs, well, they're much more likely to be technologically advanced. And I wonder what level of education and um, training and education, if you like, is required to do those jobs. And what, what will it be? Uh, and do we have enough understanding about that? Do you, do, Sam, do you want to have a go and I'll come to you, Rebecca, to, to have a think about that? Sam? Yeah, and I, I guess the question is that is are green jobs in that way distinct from the rest of the labour market? Um, because an increasing use of technology is a function of automation and other challenges that we're going to have to deal with along alongside this, which I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the green jobs are unique to. Um, but it, it sort of goes back to what I'm saying at the beginning. We, we still have this quite narrow concept of... Um, of green jobs that are focused on making, doing, whatever, which is fantastic. Like we definitely need those. But we don't have this framework of like all the other jobs that need to come alongside it. And you're right, Judith, that we absolutely like have to get to these people earlier. So if you're picking a career now, is there a suite of green courses or at least green modules on existing courses to say, this is going to be a valuable skill set in the long run. This is going to put you above the rest of the pack when it comes to comes to your career, because you're going to know how a heat pump works when that comes in, as well as knowing how to service a boiler. Are you ready to service a hydrogen boiler on side? It's all these little additional things that we need to work out. Are they best delivered in FE colleges? Are they best delivered on the job? But the problem with businesses and FE colleges at the moment is they don't really have a sense of direction of travel from the government. So there's no point putting on that course because we don't know how many, well, we know how many heat pumps we need a year, but we don't know the government are committed to de delivering that. So 
without without that really clear direction to the private sector, then we're not going to be able to deliver those those jobs, whether they're they're good or not. And and Rebecca, what is your view of what of how you define the job? Um, so I think I, I think Jude is absolutely right um, in terms of like the value of, of vocational learning, and that has absolutely um, you know taken. Um, a battering over the last um, 10 years in terms of like the adult education budget, for example, um, things like union learn has just been slashed, um, which is, you know, a way of um, unions actually helping people learn on the job and, and like improve their progression opportunities. So that's all really unhelpful <laughs> for, for helping people um, gain skills, um, not through, not just through higher education. So, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with a lot of the problem that you set out um, and I would also agree with, um, with Sam's point about especially FE colleges at the moment, just, just not being, they don't run those courses in most places because they're, that's not what they're funded to do. Um, they'll only, you know, they can, they can only guarantee funding if they can get bums on seats and they won't get bums on seats until the, you know, the direction of travel is from clear, is clear from above that um, those skills will equip you to go into jobs. Um, so it has to be part of like a really, um, a very integrated strategy that, that means um, funding those skills, identifying the skills, obviously, to begin with, um, and, you know, doing things like skills audits for, for each area, um, but also, you know, um, focusing on apprenticeships and, you know, uh, you know which, which, we, which you used to have loads of, and, um, you know, there are, there are comparatively few now, um, but green apprenticeships could absolutely be, um, you know, one solution to, to helping people get into these new jobs and, and learn on the job. They don't necessarily have to have um, degree level, you know, te technical um, uh, qualifications. So, so, so I, I, I want to get into this education um, debate. I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear from Jackie Hillary and from Jane Scott Paul um, and from Tom Schuler, who've all made points. Before I do, Barney, I'm just going to go back to you, if I might, just because there's one, there was one slide, one of those bar charts, which shows sectors that are going to be massively disrupted by the energy revolution and sectors that frankly aren't in, in employment terms. Can we just go to that and you can just talk us through it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, from uh, something called the Just uh, Transition Jobs Tracker, which is a thing by the Grantham Institute um, at LSE. Uh, and they've been sort of breaking it down by sector, looking at how many different jobs, uh, how much the workforce within each sector will need to either upskill or be in demand as a result of transitioning to net zero. So you can see obviously construction is way up there because we've got all of this housing stock in Britain that basically needs to be decarbonized and make, need to make it energy efficient. And we need to, as you know, um, Rebecca just said there, you know, have people who know how to install the heat pump, for instance. Uh, in manufacturing, it's a similar story, um, transport and storage and motor trades, you know, we've got to build this massive electric car charging network um, that requires very, very specific skills um, and a certain degree of very specialized knowledge to be able to do those things. Um, in terms of the energy sector, it's not actually broken down in here, but it would also fall into um, manufacturing and utilities, depending on what kind of energy you're producing. Um, but then you look at something like health and it looks like it's largely unaffected. I mean, I, I wonder to what degree, um, you know, how they've broken down this study, but I, you, there must be jobs that, you know, do require some sort of uh, retraining, even in those sectors, um, to, to address this question, I'd imagine. So, so let me, let me, let me, if I can, just take the points. I don't know that Jane Scott Paul, you're there, and we can hear from you. Jane, are you on the line and able to talk? Let me see. While we're waiting to get Jane, I'm going to see Jackie Hillary. I can see. Jackie, do we, I don't know whether you, in, in this new employment revolution where you have the power to unmute yourself. Yes. Okay. That's great. <laughs> Jackie, you, I mean, the, you're, t tell us what you think about the education end of this. Um, good evening. I'm, uh, this is my first tortoise thinking. I'm, I'm actually a human resources professional, but I have in the past been a trustee of my local further education organization. And I know how underfunded they are and how incredibly important they can be. The woman who used to run actually the, the Sussex outfit is now in Essex and she is a, a prime example herself in that she left school at 16 with practically nothing, became a mum very young, then went and did a, I think an English GCSE at, at, in the evenings and ended up running the course 
then ended up doing A levels, then ended up do, doing a degree, and is now actually running a college of further education in Essex, where she comes from. And I think she's a classic example of somebody who totally missed the boat first time round. And I think that still happens. Um, and, what, and, and Jackie, in your experience, because for enough, we had one of our future of work summits where we were having this conversation with a, actually a group of people who worked in HR in some of these really big companies, businesses like Unilever. And it was quite interesting talking to them because, of course, if you're a huge corporate, you actually have some resources to go and do training for those people who are employed. For a lot of people, and I'm sure some of the people that Rebecca's describing, actually it's not clear the companies have got the resources to provide you the training and skills. They don't necessarily personally have the resources. So when you think about the obstacles to adult education and, and further education, who, who steps in to enable those people to learn and reskill? Well, I mean, good question. Well, I guess it's it's FE, but you know, I guess uh, the I suppose the individual concerned has to have the, the 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 courage and the confidence to 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 you know to get in there and and go for it. Um, and I think that can be very difficult for people who failed the first time round. I mean, I'm I'm not speaking personally, I should say, but as a, as a recruiter. Yeah. And when I'm recruiting, I always look at people who haven't gone the standard route because I think they're interesting. They're often much more motivated and they have something to offer that, if, that's different. That's um, and if you do see, just out of interest, Jackie, if you do see people who say, actually, you know, I started my education late, I picked it up in my late 20s or 30s, does that actually stand in good stead with you? Do you think that probably speaks well of them? I think it does because it's so much I think because it 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 speaks of motivation because I think if you if you go into education when you're older you know you've got you know possibly kids other responsibilities you know so you've got to fit that in around all sorts of other commitments so you know I think it says a lot for somebody you know um in fact, I did some of my, I started my HR training, in fact, with the Open University, and I'm a huge fan of them as well, because I think, again, you know, that's an avenue that people go down, you know, frequently who've sort of missed the boat first time round. Yeah. Jackie, th thank you. I'm going to I'm gonna just go to um, Jane Scott Paul, if I might, and then come to Tom Schuler, just so we keep focused on this. J uh, Jane. Hello everyone. I'm really pleased to see that uh, vocational education is getting a look in and I heard mention of Siemens, which does outstanding work um, with uh, developing uh, young people, also their adult employees. I worked for uh, nearly 30 years in professional education in the, um, for the Association of Accounting Technicians, where we provided qualifications which actually led um, uh, had, it, had a complete pathway uh, from entry level uh, right through to those people who wished to go on to chartered accountancy because chartered accountancy was one occupation that kept the door open to non-graduates. And uh, we, we have to make available routes and pathways, as the previous speaker said, uh, to other people um, who may miss the boat at 18, may miss the boat at 16, and need to have other opportunities. I'm a, I spent 27 years navigating all the initiative itis of successive governments of whatever hue, trying to ensure that we kept our routes and pathways open with the support and help of further education colleges who are much undervalued in this country and do a fantastic job if they are given the opportunity. And we need to make sure that this green revolution, revolution is open uh, to a much more diverse range of entrants because like the previous speaker, I have seen people come in to our qualification who had nothing in the way of O levels, A levels, anything but through sheer hard work and the ability to learn on the job actually came out at the end with a very, very valuable qualification and skills for life. Thank and, you. Jane, Jane, can I just ask you a question? Are there countries and are there, for example, you know, your chartered accountancy point is such a good one. 
that there are, you know, there are some, there are few industries, in fact, that keep open the door as you describe it. Are there some countries or some industries that you look at as a good model for what happens next, where you don't have to have necessarily, you know, jump through those uh, academic hoops in order to make the most of the opportunities that are available in X career or in Y country? Are there examples you've got of that? I, I think the, the, the example that's often quoted is Germany, um, which has excellent uh, vocational education. I think the problem that we see in the world is a great deal of credentialization, so that the degree has now become the door opener. And if you don't have a degree, you don't even get through the door for a job. And I think that's an unfortunate change because um, certainly in my experience, there are a lot of very, very talented people who for whatever reason, didn't do a degree. And I think now that we have a 50-50 mix of people doing degrees and, and not doing degrees, we have totally neglected the people who aren't doing degrees. But this, the interesting thing about the UK is I actually think employers are much more open-minded about this than educators and yeah. the government. And I think uh, employers are perfectly willing to give people a chance and say, well, OK, um, this person looks quite sparky. This person looks quite lively. Um, I'm happy to support their learning if they show a bit of initiative and if they work hard and if they're committed. And that, I think, is um, a resource that we don't do enough to liberate uh, because we, we can bring employers on board and it needs to be a partnership between employers, further education and um, and, and you know the, the funding and initiatives that are available. But, but the problem with government, they very often impose a kind of dead hand uh, mm -hmm. where they want everything to be in a, you know, they want to offer everything in a particular way and they want to look as if they're dramatically improving opportunities. They just need to let people get on with it, people who understand it. Jane, thank you. I can't make sure I understand what you mean. By, uh, by the way, I did like the word initiativitis, but the word prudentialization, your point being that we've got used to being so averse to risk, we take, you know, university degrees as some insurance against against risk when we're hiring people. Is that, is that Yes, I mean, when I entered employment, uh, the the thing that you had to have to get through the door was O level English, O level maths. Right. And above that, okay, you come through the door and we'll, we'll sort you out and get you going. Now, you won't even be looked at if you haven't got a degree. They won't even open the CV. Yeah. And furthermore, there are very pernicious uh, algorithms which won't even open the door if you haven't got a degree from a Russell Group University. Yeah. And we need to look at the person and say, let's see what this person can do and how can we help them do it? Yeah, it's, but, um, Jane. Thank you. I, I, I saw Tom Schuller's nodding as you're uh, as you're talking. Tom, I, I wanted to hear what you think on this because you weighed in on the FE point as well. Yes, um, I mean I've worked most of my professional life in adult education in universities, but I chaired the governing board of an adult education college in London for ten years, and I mean the the devastation wrought on the FE sector in the last ten years is pretty severe. 25% absolute terms cut. So while universities may complain, I mean, the colleges have taken a far heavier hit. Uh, and on top of that, as Rebecca mentioned, the abolition of the Union Learning Fund, which was a fantastic way of reaching people who hadn't been successful first time round. So there's a lot of ground. We've, we've gone very far backwards. Someone referred to direction of travel. Direction of travel has been backwards in the last 10 years a long way and I think why I was nodding so much particularly with the with Jane's points about initiativitis is there's no stability of funding for most of these colleges they've got to work on it year on year they've got to pivot because someone thinks it's going to be a good idea to try something in this area and FE is is so under regarded and and actually poorly understood in most by most politicians and most policy makers because their kids on the whole haven't been anywhere near those colleges. 
But I wanted to ask both Rebecca and Sam, there's a real challenge here because uh, who is going to do the teaching uh, or the training for these green skills? I mean, this, this can't just be switched on um, uh, from one month or even, uh, you know, one quarter to another. So I think everyone on this, on this um, thinking would presumably agree let's give more money to FE colleges or colleges, let's have more training. But where are you going to find uh, the people who are going to deliver the training? And I think that's a, that's a really tough challenge. You know, just make one more semi-political point at least, which is FE teachers, I'm not, a, I'm not a UCU member, but I'm just speaking as someone who's been a governor. I mean, FE teachers have been run into the ground. They're paid less than school teachers. Uh, they're not given status. It's very difficult now to really guarantee um, a good quality level of support, uh, of recruitment and so on for the staffing of FE. And I think, you know, that, that that's a real challenge as to where you're going to find the people who are going to deliver them. So I'd be very interested in Sam and Rebecca's uh, ideas on that. So, Tom, thank you. So would I. Who wants to go first? Both quite hard questions. I'm going to, Rebecca, I'll play you in first. I mean, um, I, um, yeah, I, mean, I should say that, you know, this, this is not um, my area of expertise in terms of, you know, like in terms of uh, adult education. Um, but I would say that one of the things, and I agree with you that that's, that's definitely um, one of the big challenges. Um, I'd say that one of the things that, it, that we would need is like more like industry-led teaching so you know more apprenticeships um more on the job teaching i mean there are certain industries you know where the uh, we're far behind other places and um the way that you know the, in, you know, the companies work now is that they are usually multinational co companies the ones that are kind of like driving um these steps for so for example siemens gamesa um, it's actually not Siemens anymore, it's just it's Siemens Gamesa, I think they're Spanish owned now. Um, so, you know, they, they can use experts from all over the world um, to come and, um, and, and, and teach both, uh, both on the job, I suppose, but also potentially, I can't, there could be, you know, some way of like, te you know, teacher training, teaching, you know, training the trainers um, sort of thing. But um, I probably shouldn't take up any more time given that I don't have a brilliant answer. I wonder if Sam has any, any like epiphanies. Uh, I mean, not a great deal. I mean, so to take an example of the Green Homes Grant, right? There was one of the reasons that was pulled is because Treasury thought it was going to do something very different to what Bayes thought it was going to do. So the Department of Business thought, here's a fantastic home decarbonisation programme that's going to be in for the long run and we're going to finally sort our homes. Treasury looked at it in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic and went, great, we're going to get millions of jobs on the ground straight away and they're going to start immediately. What Treasury realised about six months in is that you're right, Tom, this stuff has like hugely long lead times. You have to train people, you have to hire people, you have to train the people who are going to train the people. And we haven't had that long-term commitment. And there's still not a long-term commitment to say, what's the point of me as a FE college at the moment, hiring somebody who understands how to build a zero carbon home? Because the zero carbon home standard isn't coming in for another five years. So if we bring forward dates, if we tell the private industry what we want to do, and if we mediate between industry and between further education colleges, it incentivizes the employment. The loss of the RDAs, the sort of malfunction of the, of the LEPs means we don't have an institution that's doing that mediation, which is encouraging further education colleges to actually distinguish themselves by saying, we've got these new cutting edge technologies. And there's always a small scale example, there's always somewhere. So on home decolonization, look at Energy Sprong, which is this fantastic zero carbon home neighborhood in Nottingham built by a Dutch company, yes, but if we committed to that, if we brought that in as the standard, then you could start to have colleges in Nottingham recruiting people, and then you get the spillover effects, and then gradually we can expand to the UK, but it has to have government go, this is not a one-year lead time, this is a 10-year lead time. And, 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 can, and can I ask you, sort of, if you were trying to organise government to give them a set of targets that they could, that they could measure, how would you, how would you, how, by the way, I should just say, Tom, did that question, uh, the points that Rebecca and Sam made there, did that answer the, answer the points you were trying to raise? Sorry, you're just muted. Let's see if we can unmute you. There we go. 
in, in part. I mean, it's a tough one. I think you have to look outside the colleges to all sorts of places. I just wanted actually, sorry, to add one point on the comparative. You asked James about countries. I mean, Germany is always cited on the vocational training, but they train their young people very extensively. They're, they're not so wonderful on training the adults and on getting new people in. And I think they're probably better if you're looking for any models. The Scandinavian countries are the ones that always really have committed themselves to adult learning in the broader sense. And I think what we're trying to do here is give people of all ages the confidence that they can change careers without necessarily knowing exactly what it is that they're going to do. And that's, there's a cultural element there uh, as well. But I entirely agree with what Sam said about the government's role is giving a longer term steer so that institutions like colleges as well as employers can plan rather than being knocked about from, you know, six months to six months. It, it's absolutely setting that longer term uh, framework. Tom, thank you. I, I want to finish with two points, a, a one for each of you, if I might. Rebecca, the, the first is with you. You touched on the idea of regionalism, of some version of, you know, regional, I suppose, both, you know, market setting capabilities and investment capabilities to, to enable new jobs to be created and, and people to be retrained. Where do you see the best examples of that? And what kinds of things need to be devolved for that to happen? Um, so I think that, firstly, what, what absolutely needs to happen is there needs to be a national framework above that, you know, to, to give, give space um, and, crucially, resources um, for the, and, and then devolve powers for, for the actual like nuts and bolts to be led at, at, at regional and local level. Um, Examples of that, I mean, in, in the UK, we have, um, you know, some devolution. Um, Wales is actually doing a lot of really good stuff. They have an act called the Future Generations Act, um, which requires um, them as policy unit makers, as, as lawmakers, to think about future generations um, when they are planning, not just, you know, the here and now. Um, and at the moment, they are doing a lot of stuff on, um, on green jobs, particularly on um, improving access to um, minority groups um, and people who often um, suffer from discrimination in the labour market um, to get into those jobs. So making them good jobs and making them accessible to everyone. So that's one example in um, Jamie Driscoll, the mayor in um, North of Tyne, um, also has a, a Green New Deal and um, I think has, plan, has got plans to create 100,000 um, construction jobs, which will be you know, particularly focused on the retrofitting challenge there. Um, so, but you know, they can only do that because they've got the powers and actually that doesn't exist throughout the UK. And um, I would argue that it needs to be, you know, that those powers need to be devolved to much more places um, so that the people that are actually, you know, that really know their areas, know, know what's needed, um, can, yeah, can make the decisions that affect their constituencies. And Sam, this is a, is a, is a different question really, which is when you think about how government itself is organised, right, and Bayes, education, treasury, you know, the, the way in which we're organised, Someone put to me the other day that there are basically sort of three ways in which the world is going to be transformed, you know, DNA, CO2, silicon, right? The, how we respond to those three things will be the way in which the next 30 years of our society determined. Given your experience of looking at government a bit now, do you think we've got something that's structured right? No. Well, I mean, it, it can work. Um, the, I think the big barrier we have when it comes to making government policy is that we have this super ministry that both controls the finances and fiscal spending and also controls economic policy. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is without their buy-in, without their heft, we don't really get anything done. So we've got a comprehensive spending review coming up this year where government will set out what it plans to spend for the next three years. Ideally, if net zero is your number one priority as a government, you would want all spending plans to be aligned to net zero and to put that the onus on government on government departments to do that when they submit their spending plans. If the Treasury puts the same weight behind net zero as they put behind fiscal rectitude, then we'd be in a good place. But at the moment, they see it as the PM's priority, they see it as Bayes' priority, and it's not there. So yes, you can work with the inside the existing system, but it's somebody's going to need to kick out the arse. 
<laughs> okay, well, that already appeals to me, I have to say. That already appeals <laughs> to me. Um, uh, but listen, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to try and do two things, if I might, just to let everyone know kind of where our thinking is going, because our aim is with this accelerating net zero coalition is that we take some forward and then we by the time we get to cop we've got a body of thinking so i just want to sort of play back to you a couple of the kind of really key things that, that i heard i think it's really interesting rebecca that actually you know while you talk about a you know a fair dialogue and an inclusive dialogue and the importance of unions how quickly actually the room if you like moves to education and it's striking i think that one of the things that's come up quite a fair bit in the last six months is that when we went in the first six months of the pandemic, everyone was talking about healthcare and social care. And in the last six months, there's such a focus on what my colleague Matt Dancona calls the national education emergency, that actually we should talk about a national education emergency. And the risk is that we're gonna come into another summer of squabbling about how the exam systems work when the actual education systems are not necessarily gonna build us a society and economy that we want. And I'm really struck you know, I'm embarrassed, Tom, to say that, you know, when you describe, you know, a world of people who don't fully understand FE, I think to myself, yeah, that'll be, you're talking not to me, but about me. And, and when you think about, you know, the economics of this, I think that's really, really significant. So I feel as though that is a train of work for us that we can do that's quite useful because it's classic, yeah, exactly, to a very good point, but it's also classic tortoise territory, which is, they're not great pictures, it doesn't move very fast, but it is nonetheless a really significant area of the way in which our society and economy is going to work. So I think the national education emergency is really interesting. Um, I think that I think that this second question about skills, and, and, and Sam and Rebecca, you both touched on this, is really interesting. And Judith, you know, I think you sort of made two points, but I think opened us up to sort of four or five, as in, you know, what are the skills? Who are the skills teachers? What are going to be the benefits of those skills? I'm really struck by Chris McHugh's point, which is, you know, we're talking about people moving into the labor market. What about those people who are halfway or two thirds of the way through their professional working lives and need fundamental changes in terms of how they skill? We, ju just to let you know, at the end of this Future of Work Summit, we talked about, could we create a skills index? So, you know, we've got the Responsibility 100 Index. We map, uh, actually, this be, may be able to get your help on this, Jackie, that we, we map the top, the FTSE 100 companies against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And since then, we've started mapping, well, okay, well, look, let's just take a slice on climate. And then we've created the Disability 100, which is let's look at those 100 companies and the way in which they do or mostly don't report disability. But actually, there's an obvious thing here, which is to do the Skills 100, to do which companies are actually investing in skills. And I take Jane Scott Paul's point really seriously, which is we need to think not just about the offer of skills, but the access that those companies provide. And obviously, what's implicit in this conversation is how do you think about skills beyond those big companies? How do you think about those, you know, skills training regionally? And so I just wanted to say, I hope that what happens as a result of this conversation is it doesn't sort of end with the end of the hour, I can see at the end of the hour, but that Rebecca and Sam, the, the way in which you framed it, the way in which you've helped us kind of organize our thinking about what a green job is, what those distinctions are between green jobs, what the needs are going to be in different regions within the UK, and what that then asks of people of companies of educational organizations and of government that will will take what we've learned today and kind of try and build it up towards something that we pull together meaningfully in in the autumn that is a result of this coalition that's accelerating net zero so i just wanted to say on a hot evening where everyone you know would be quite tempted to lie in a cool bath uh, thank you for making the time to join us uh, uh, Rebecca Diskey and Sam Alvis in particular uh, we can't thank you we can't even buy you a cold drink but uh, we can uh, appreciate uh, you spending the time with us thanks very much everyone have a good evening